Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Game Nintendo.com video, we're going to be further discussing the Xbox 720 and the recent rumors that it actually features the Xbox 360 SOC or system on a chip. Or to those of you who are not really sure what that is, that would be the GPU and the CPU along with a few other key components actually bundled into the system. This would mean that the system would theoretically have not just complete full backward compatibility with the Xbox 360, but it would also, according to the rumors, have the 360's hardware completely at the disposal of developers for Durango titles as well. In other words, it would increase the Durango's processing power. Now, in yesterday's video, I went into some details, but um, because of all the other rumors as well um, that this chap had actually um, given, I couldn't go too much into it as much as I wanted. So, today is another day, and I have done some research into this, um, because... As it turns out, there are a number of issues. I'm not going to go into all of them at the start, but I'm going to certainly give a couple of them. One is the biggest one, and that is that it has a power PC architecture for the CPU and DX9 for the GPU, which is completely contrary, of course, to the rest of the rumored specifications of the Xbox 720. The other big one would be a programming for the various hardware components. Now, I'm going to break this down into, first of all, talking about um, another one of the problems. Now, I mentioned already, one of the big issues with this is that this is completely contrary to another set of rumors with the Xbox Mini. And that is that the Xbox Mini, all rumors have pointed to Xbox Mini existing. All rumors have pointed to the fact that the Xbox Mini does not include a drive of any description other than a hard drive. In other words, you download the games. However, if you want to play disc games, in other words, if you were to go into a store, for example, buy Gears of War Judgment, you could not play it on your Xbox 720. The rumors were that you would actually need to hook the Mini up to the Xbox 720, which is another reason the Xbox Mini was actually cheap. They are saying it's going to be $100. Another reason, of course, is because they want to compete with uh, Apple TV and they want the Xbox Mini to be like a competitive Apple Mini device, uh, Apple TV device, I'm sorry. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, and the purpose of this was basically that the Durango would act as the disk drive and the control unit, and the Xbox Mini would pretty much just play the game. So in other words, it would be the, the hardware. Now, this of course is completely contrary to this rumor. In other words, one of these has to be false, or at least not true to a certain degree, because obviously it doesn't need the Xbox Mini to plug into it if it's already got the sock. In other words, what's the point? You're just going to be emulating the same hardware. Um, so if the Xbox 360 sock is really there, the previous rumors about the Xbox Durango plugging into the 360 are just false. Okay, we discussed that yesterday. Um, so let's instead focus on the other two major points. One would be the actual GPU slash CPU and the integration into the unit. The other would be programming for it. Now I'm going to discuss integration first. In terms of bandwidth and so forth, I don't really consider it to be a problem. The Xbox 360 has a, a reasonable amount of um, embedded RAM. Now, I'm assuming the SOC, and this is an assumption on my part, I don't have the specifications, I do not have, you know, the, the Xbox 720's design documents, but I'm assuming that it would actually come with the embedded RAM on the GPU. I believe that's 8, no, 10 megabytes, if I remember correctly. Yep, a quick Google confirms I'm right. I like to check these things for you guys. And so it's likely that that would still be there. Therefore, it has a frame buffer of sorts, a very quick memory for the Xbox 360 and GPU. In terms of overall bandwidth, we have the 32 megabytes that is supposedly there. That's the ES RAM. That combined with the DDR3 RAM will give you the bandwidth required. Now, let's talk about the PlayStation 4 for a second. I know some of you may not have a, you know, care in the world for the PS4. You might be loving the Xbox but hate the PlayStation, but we, it's the best point of comparison for a moment, since supposedly they are using the same CPU. Now, 
we know that the Xbox um, 360, sorry, the Xbox 720 is using the similar CPU. So what we can do is we can say, hey, the bandwidth from a developer's comment was saying that the PS4's CPU is using about 20 gigabytes per second of the total or bandwidth for the PlayStation 4. Now the PS4 has about 176 gigabytes per second of total or bandwidth. It's worth noting that Xbox 720 has substantially less if you only count the DDR3. You can't, of course. Um, the ES RAM is working in conjunction of this. Nevertheless, even if you completely ignore this 32 megabytes of quick memory, the DDR3 RAM is more than enough to pretty much saturate the Jaguar. As I said before, the Jaguar is only using supposedly around 20 gigabytes per second of total memory bandwidth. Now, DDR3 RAM itself, the actual amount of bandwidth you're going to be looking at is going to be very, very, very up in the air. Mostly because DDR3 runs at very very different speeds you can get them quite slow um, all the way up to like 1600 megahertz or faster but generally speaking you're looking at 20 to 30 gigabytes per second in other words you know it has a roughly more than sufficient speed uh, to basically fuel the jaguar course um, in this case in fact it's worth noting that the ivy bridge from Intel, as I've mentioned in a previous video, has around one third, in other words, it will receive data about one third faster than the Jaguar. So DDR3 RAM equals no problem. The real reason, of course, for the GDR5 is because of the actual GCN cores. Now we know the PS4 does have more than the Xbox 720, 18 compared to 12, supposedly. Um, so the real key performance here is going to be the ES RAM, supposedly, um, assuming these specifications are true. However, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to say that all of the specifications are true for one reason, because this same set of rumors have actually confirmed that all the other specifications are true, minus this omission. So in other words, the CPU being at 1.6 gigahertz, the DDR3 RAM, although the actual speed of the DDR3 RAM hasn't been 100% confirmed, uh, and everything else is, you know, fine. We know all of that. So, instead, let's talk about, you know, could it actually be done? Well, if you actually look at the overall system architecture, it could be fitted in. Um, you know, power requirements, fine. It's not really going to eat up that much juice. Um, so that's good. Obviously, the manufacturing process has been extremely refined now anyway. Um, in terms of sense, it makes a lot of sense from backwards compatibility. In another way, it actually probably boosts the Xbox 720 sales. Why? Because when the Xbox 720 is first released, let's say you, previous generation, owned either a Wii or a PS3, or you didn't own a console or whatever, but you just didn't own an Xbox 360, or you own an Xbox 360 and you want to sell it. Well, arguably, one of the, the better options would be for Microsoft to include the SOC, the Xbox 360 compatibility, straight away, because that means it just increases the amount of games that you are able to buy on launch day. Therefore, it makes you more willing to buy the console on launch day, assuming there's only a couple of other games you want that are Xbox 720 native. Okay, so let's ignore the coding side of things, and let's talk, ignore the business side of things. You know, is it financially viable and so forth for a second? And let's actually instead focus on perhaps the big, you know, elephant in the room, if you will, and that would be the fact that it's power PC based. Now, there were some changes, of course, for the CPU with, um, of course, the um, Xbox 360. Uh, you know, it was slightly customized, but generally speaking, it's certainly what you'd expect. So as I was saying earlier, I've been doing some previous research into this and how viable it actually would be to either run um, X. 86 or 64 code on this CPU or you know even emulated or something like that um, I listen to a couple of options now first of all there have already been a few examples of this in history in famous ones as well 
The original Xbox actually had a variation of the Pentium 3 processor. Now, I'm going to save you guys from Googling. Um, it was a custom Pentium 3, a copper mine. This is directly from Wiki. And that would be the Micro PGA2 package. Although it's soldered directly onto a motherboard using BGA. Um, now, if you want to research the specifications, you can. I would always recommend you do. But basically, this was... In the height around 99 to 2003 there were many different variations of this the xbox one was running at 733 megahertz as some of you may know but the key thing to remember is it's an x86 32-bit cpu okay so x86 32-bit great now remember the xbox 360 did emulate xbox one titles fine but it was using a backwards compatibility software to do this now you're going to immediately think to yourself, but hang on, one of the arguments that's been made for one of the reasons that the Xbox 360 sock is required in the first place is because, well, the Xbox 360 couldn't be emulated in the hardware. There's a couple of reasons for this, allow me to illustrate it further. The Xbox 360 CPU is substantially faster than the Xbox One. I'm not going to bother to go into the actual, um, you know, uh, flops for this, but I think the Xbox One was a total of something like, I don't know, uh, just a couple of flops for the uh, CPU. Um, I did actually have a total of about five, I think, when I did a research for this the other day. I do have an article on this, and I'll try to post it for you guys so you can see the list of the various um, boosts on CPU functionality. Okay, I've got a lot of figures in my head, guys. Sorry, I can't remember that exactly, but it's certainly, you know, not much more than about five. So... If you compare that to the Xbox 360, we're talking a magnitude higher, not just, you know, four, five, six, seven times. We're talking a lot higher. The Xbox 360 to Xbox 720 is not. The CPU is faster, but it's not hugely faster. Also, you've got the other uncomfortable situation with the Xbox 720 CPU that the actual clock speeds are running a little bit slower. Therefore, it's even harder to do it and of course, are both are extremely multi-thread based. Um, so it's going to be a lot harder to program backwards compatibility in there. I'm not saying it would be impossible. I'm not a hardware engineer or software engineer for that matter, but I, I, I personally doubt it would be able to be done. So that's the reason that it, that it can't be done in reverse. However, um, you have had an incident, well, um, an example, should I say, right there of a... Um, PowerPC architecture running x86, it's doable. So what about other examples in um, famous computing? Well, there have actually been a number as it turns out. Most of them are done either by custom bits of hardware or, in other cases, actual custom bits of code. And we're going to discuss both and give examples of both, just so you, uh, you guys have an idea. Now, once again, I just want to reiterate, I am not saying these rumors are true. I am merely providing um, reasons how they could be true. So it's up to you guys to interpret this however you want. In fact, I'd actually encourage you all to go ahead and do your own research on this and give me your ideas because, you know, I've not managed to think of everything. I'm sure I've probably missed something ridiculously obvious or something like that because at the end of the day, as I said, these are only my thoughts and opinions. Now, there are several ways, as I was saying, to do this. The first would be a fairly lengthy and difficult one. Um, the actual developers could pretty much write the code themselves. There is a massive issue with this. If they were to actually have to write this themselves, you can imagine just how convoluted it's going to become very, very quickly, particularly for either smaller developers or even larger ones, especially at the start. I know I've used the example of the Saturn dozens of times, but it actually remains to be one of my favorite examples out of any console. Why? Because it was one of those examples where the system was tacked on, in other words, various parts of the hardware was tacked on, specifically a second CPU and video processing system. Supposedly, the reason behind this was because they were apprehensive after seeing, or should I say hearing, about the PlayStation, uh, the original PlayStation, mind you, actual performance in 3D, and they realized, oh dear, 
we've actually designed a console primarily for 2D. Is it possible that we're seeing the N64 rumors and, of course, the Sony rumors that, you know, maybe the market wants 3D more? And, of course, they then tacked on stuff. And it wasn't the system wasn't capable, it's just that it was a bit more difficult to program for. So, you could do it, but there were a number of concerns, including, of course, the fact that the CPUs, the dual CPU design, not only was it difficult to um, run parallel systems back then because of crappy programming tools, the other problem was that only one memory unit, or should I say only one CPU, could access the memory at a time. So, in other words, the 4KB, I know, astounding amounts, right, of cache on the CPUs was a prerequisite. In other words, it had to be used for optimal performance performance so that could be one issue in other words if you leave the developers that own devices they're just going to say hmm not really sure about this one bro and they're probably not going to use it to its fullest potential so what about other examples now i did say earlier just moments ago that there are hardware options and software options so let's discuss both as i was saying now software options there are a couple this one comes from us to us via, um, believe it or not, a Macintosh. Now, as you guys know, PowerPC was used for quite a while on a Mac, the PowerPC architecture. Now they've moved to x86. But we've actually got two examples, funnily enough, from Mac. The first, when they actually transitioned to PowerPC. And the second when they are more established with PowerPC and they're saying, you know what, forget this, we want to move to x86. I'm not going to turn this into an argument of which one's better, by the way. Um, in 2001, a company by the name of Transitive Technologies um, demonstrated PowerPC applications running at well over 1 gigahertz equivalent PowerPC speeds on a 1.4 gigahertz Athlon uh, processor. Uh, that was at the microprocessor forum. Now, I'm going to read a quote on this. Transitive announced, announced, I'm sorry, it's a dynamite code morphing software at Embedded Processor Forum earlier this year. Since then, they have been working on specific demonstrations that would be compelling for future customers. Last month, Transitive announced a dynamic, sorry, Dynamite X slash M, which allows x86 code to run on MIPS processors. Transitive's CEO um, told Mac Central that PowerPC's x86 conversion software is now available at alpha slash evaluation at stage. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, Dynamite is fast and it gets faster the longer the application is used. Dynamite examines the code as it translates and works to optimize output as it ultimately sends it to the CPU. With each iteration, with each iteration of the task, Dynamite moves more relevant data to the processor cache and discards more code that the application does not need. So you guys have one example there. I've actually gonna do an I've done an article on this by the way. I always do the article first so I can take um, certain parts of this and discuss them more heavily but I would recommend if you're curious to check the article out I am going to include reference links so you guys can you know use that to do your own research as a springboard if you so wish so anyway we're going to move on to a second example this one comes to us via Wikipedia and it basically points out that and they have got various links of course to this um, certain applications do work fine. This was when they were first transitioning from PowerPC to x86 um, processors, which of course are provided to them by Intel. But regardless, certain applications such as dashboard widget, widgets, I'm sorry, scripts and so forth, um, execute inside an interpreter, all work immediately on both processors are immune to changes, but OS X or OS X applications that cannot be migrated run inside a PowerPC dynamic translator on Intel called Rosetta. And Rosetta was originally implemented, so limited to G3 instruction set, but currently supports various other instructions. I'm not going to bother to list them all. Rosetta is an instruction translator um, comparable to 68K emulator that allows PowerPC Macintoshes to run. Um, pre PowerPC code rather than virtual systems like Classic. It doesn't require 
the circuit operating system to be loaded as a subsystem before the application can work and um, has been encapsulated in the Macintosh since OS 10.3 um, and so forth. So in other words, fantastic, right? Now, if you guys want to read about your, this stuff yourself, you can, but certainly speaking, Rosetta, I mean, I'm just going to read the first line of its own um, its own uh, Wikipedia article. Rosetta is a dynamic binary translator for Mac OS X that allows many PC power PC, I'm sorry, applications to run on certain Intel-based Macintosh computers without modification uh, and so forth. So, yeah. There's also, of course, the chance that some of this could be hard-coded onto um, various translator chips. It's unknown at this point. I do, once again, do not have the papers in front of me. So, what about the DX9 issue? Uh, I think we've kind of discussed this. In other words, it's possible. It's a bit convoluted. Um, my guess, if this uh, does work, by the way, is that developers themselves will not really have to worry about this. In other words, it will probably be wrapped up. And I, if I were Microsoft, personally, and I'm obviously not, I really wish I were, but I'm not, I would do one of two things. Well, I'd give the developers one of two options, shall I say. First option I'd give them is that they have an overall API and whatever else that's basically smoothing over the surfaces. The negative with this is it would probably reduce performance a little bit because it would be an all-in-one uh, translator slash emulator slash whatever you want to call it. Therefore, you're going to lose a little bit of performance. The other option would be that you know they could get right down and dirty and they can write it however they would want. It would be good if they had both options. I don't necessarily know if they can. I guess it really depends on just the level of... Um, depth, if you will, how deep they allow them to dive into the coding. So, what about the other one? What about the other elephant in the room, the DX9 issue? Now, of course, the processor, or should I say, the graphics processor of the Xbox is fairly old. I'm talking about the Xbox 360, and it's DX9 based. So, DX9, and certainly it doesn't have the GCN core structure as well. Now, there are a couple of ways that this could be done, um, and this is just purely off the top of my head. Both the PowerPC processor, or should I just, let's just call it the SOC. The SOC could either be used for stuff such as texture streaming, or UI drawing, or possibly physics stuff, or various other bits that it doesn't really matter about the DX9 limitations. That's possible. Um, it could also be used for maybe display work, uh, overlays, uh, certain game um, game functions. Um, that type of thing could easily be done, of course, even on DX9. Indeed, hardware physics, for example, with NVIDIA doesn't actually require um, DX9 to run. Oh, sorry, DX11 to run. So... Yeah, you can kind of make your own assumptions on that. Once again, I'm not saying these rumours are true. I'm just pointing out that there are possibilities and ways it could be, you know, it could work. My concerns are numerous. As I said, I, I'm a little bit dubious about these rumours, mostly because there has been several rumours that argue against this. Um... The prime one would be, of course, Xbox Mini's existence and the fact that it's actually a requirement for Xbox 720's backwards compatibility as according to a previous rumour, so that one has to be false. The various issues they would have to deal with, such as getting x86 or 64 code to run on a power PC architecture. The other one would be extra cost. As I said, I'm not that bothered about the cost factor. I don't really think it would cost that much. Um, the other one, of course, is the simple coding issues. The other one is the technical. The more components you have in your system, 
the more likelihood it's going to go wrong. It's that simple. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. The more convoluted the system is, the more paths it has, the more um, different components it has, there's just more likelihood it's going to be wrong. It's like if you've ever created a web page, for example, or you've created a piece of art in Photoshop, or you've ever typed a document out in Word, you get the idea. Have you ever noticed that it's really easy to spot a spelling mistake, for example, if you've only got, say, I don't know, 20, you know, 20 words on screen? On the other hand, try doing that if you've got, you know, 7,000 words on screen and things like, you know, and, and, or, you know, you spell weather wrong, you know, you put the other type of weather, so, you know, weather or not, rather than the cloudy day weather. You know what I'm saying? In other words, there are so many different ways that you could screw up, but it's very unlikely you're going to notice that on that much amount of coding. Same thing goes for hardware in this case. Cooling are not too much of a problem. I think the Xbox 720 SOC would be fairly cool now to run. For all intents and purposes, from what I understand about the Xbox Mini, it's a very small console. You'd expect so, but the name Mini anyway. Uh, <laughs> certainly can't be as the Xbox, as big as the Xbox One, right? I mean, you'd expect it to be pretty damn titchy. So, I don't think cooling is going to be an issue. Power is not going to be really an issue. The power consumption is probably going to be negligible. Probably run on a couple of Duracell batteries, to be honest. Okay, I kid, of course, but you get the idea. So, is it possible? Probably. It's probably possible in terms of if they had the expertise in-house. It's Microsoft. They probably do. Um, there have been some rumors for a while that they have been indeed snapping up various architects from, from I'm sorry, AMD and from, of course, IBM. Um, ironically enough, IBM and, of course, AMD, well, not ironically, but IBM and, of course, um, AMD are the two companies that produce the Jaguar and the PowerPC processor. So you can kind of take away from that what you want. AMD, of course, also produced the graphics card. I laid back then it was ATI for the, the Xbox 360. Now, of course, uh, AMD bought out ATI, so they're just known as AMD. So it's really up to you on this one. Personally, I'm going to err on the... I, I don't know, so I'm going to say it's possible but not 100% likely. I'm going to probably go 50%. Why 50%? Because I think that there are arguments for it to be true. And there have been a massive surprises on console launches before. You know, um, I don't think anyone, for example, back when the PlayStation 1 first was released, I don't think anyone expected Sony to say, hey, you know what, this system's too expensive, we're going to drop it by 100 bucks. The only reason they did that, of course, was to compete with Sega, because Sega released their system a lot earlier. No one expected Sony to, let's say, decide to put 8 gigs of RAM on the system. No one expected either the video or AMD to postpone their graphics card launch. And there have been numerous other examples. I could be here till the cows come home on, you know, of the various massive surprises in the tech industry sometimes it's just unknown uh i think one of the big ones of course is microsoft when they decided to remove the start bar and change it how it is so it's down to start screen i don't think anyone really expected that everyone expected the start menu to be here until i don't know maybe we've got holographic technology or we could just think about it or something or we could say computer doom free and it would launch it for us i don't know um no one really expected them to make that tra uh, change and as it turns out it's been fairly unpopular actually uh he says it's been trying to struggle with windows server 2012 anyway uh yeah so i know this has not exactly been 100 percent conclusive either way i like to give you guys the facts on this you can make your own decisions definitely the emulation technology is there the technical expertise is there but is it worth the extra, all this effort from Microsoft for what is effectively 250, you know, G flops a second, roughly maybe 240 actually for the Xbox 360 GPU? Well, I'll leave you to figure that out. I suppose, on the other hand. If you're Microsoft and you're in a console battle and you need every last bit of power you can to compete against your competitor, in this case the PlayStation 4, 
well. Those 250 G flops are looking quite tasty, aren't they? Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you found it somewhat helpful, and I will see you soon. Take care, and bye for now. Have a great day.